My next guest is an adventure travel YouTuber with over a million subscribers and a TV host. After working for several years creating short films for tourism brands worldwide, he turned his sights to YouTube where he began an adventure travel channel focusing on the world's most bizarre attractions and unique cultures. This week on the podcast, we are heading to Satan's Castle, where what was meant to be a quiet night of solo camping turned into shots being fired, running from the police. And what happened, my guest will tell you. I am delighted to introduce Mike Corey from Fearless and Far to the podcast. It's good to be here. Well, it's an absolute pleasure to finally get you on. I mean, your story, I remember back in 2017, watching one of your videos about the Mexican hammer bombs or whatever you call them. <laughs> Exploding Hammer Festival, yeah. Ex <laughs> yeah, and I was absolutely hooked by the sort of level of production that your travel videos go in. And it's an absolutely incredible sort of get you on to sort of talk about some of these adventures that you've done over the past sort of six, seven years. I uh, will get into that, but at the beginning, I always like to start for the audience who don't know you. Who are you? Where are you from? And how did you get into this sort of life of adventures? Cool. Well, I am a small town Canadian boy from Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. So it's right above Maine and uh, in the United States, if you're more familiar with there. F grew up in the woods and my how I got into this, I guess I've, I've kind of teased out the story after 10 years of thinking about it. But my, my parents are both very interested in the outdoor world, the natural world. And we would go to the rocky beaches of, of New Brunswick, Canada. And there there's a bay called the Bay of Fundy that has the highest tides in the world. 55 vertical feet of water, like vertical feet of water, twice a day goes up and down. And so it just carves the landscape and it's full of tide pools and creatures and the water's like that cold North Atlantic water. And we used to go there specifically to rocky beaches to flip over rocks, to find crabs and sea cucumbers and whatever we could find. And my parents taught me that. And I became obsessed with flipping over rocks, even walking the trails behind our house. Every time there was a rock, I'd have to flip it to see if there was a salamander or a snake or a spider. And that became my obsession. And then I think what's happened is I just turned the whole world into a bunch of giant rocks. And so now for what I've been doing for the past 10 years of my life, is traveling to some lesser known countries uh, like Turkmenistan, Congo, Mauritania, uh, and finding these lesser known things to explain them to the world. Because I realized back then when I was a kid that people thought, you know, sea cucumbers were slimy and gross and spiders were disgusting and dangerous, but they weren't. People didn't have a good understanding of these things. They maybe had some they they absorbed this knowledge that snakes are dangerous or spiders are icky or slimy. I don't know. And then now that's what everyone thought. But I knew, I knew the truth and I made a, my, my passion to tell people about, hey, spiders aren't so bad. Snakes aren't so bad. And now it's like, you know, the Exploding Hammer Festival isn't so bad or <laughs> Turkmenistan is kind of bad, but, you know, not as not as bad as people <laughs> make it out to be. And so now I found myself in an interesting career where I it started off with a YouTube channel. Uh, which has now about 1.2 million followers. I have a TV show, a couple TV shows. And now it's one called Uncharted Adventure, which is on the Weather Channel in the USA, which is a one-hour adventure travel show that I host. Uh, I was on BBC Travel Show before that. And also I host a podcast called Against the Odds, where me and a co-host, we tell, we tell true survival stories of people on this planet and then try to get them on to talk about their, their stories. So uh, besides that, I'm on the road all the time. Like I, I'm from New Brunswick, Canada. I'm there a couple weeks a year. I'm mostly just a floater, man, trying to follow my nose like Toucan Sam, but uh, for adventure. I think it's that sort of curiosity that you have from a young kid that sort of probably led you down this path of wanting to always look around the corner, sort of the sort of fear of missing out, not knowing what was sort of under that rock. And as you said, you know, uh, similar is that sort of curiosity with places like Turkmenistan, um, one of the most sort of closed off countries in the world. You know, I, I'd say my audience, I'd be lucky to grab 1% who had been to Turkmenistan, but it is one of the most crazy, bizarre places that one can visit. And I imagine a lot of people would always get put off by the sort of horror stories of Turkmenistan. Uh, but as you say, that sort of curiosity and that sort of excitement to explore sort of led you in and to see for your own eyes. 
And you always get that sort of idea of, you know, you hear these stories about certain places and, you, you know, it's all terrifying. And then when you go, you actually find the reality is completely different. Exactly. And we, the people there are always <laughs> the most incredible. I, I think the whole tourism friendly thing is backwards, honestly, after traveling to these countries, because the most rudely I've been treated is in like France and, you know, uh, um, in the Netherlands and places like that. Uh, whereas the, the, the people who go out of their way to invite me into their homes for coffee is like Mauritania, Turkmenistan, Pakistan, these countries that are tourist unfriendly. It's backwards, man. <laughs> Stand in the bike lane in, in, in Europe and <laughs> you'll see uh, some unfriendliness. Not saying Europeans are unfriendly, but like in these <laughs> countries, you'd expect everyone to be mean and nasty and like villains from a, a Bond film. Uh, they go out of their way to, to, to make you comfortable and happy. Yeah. You suffered from Paris syndrome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I did have a good time in Paris the one time I was there. There was a couple moments with, of, uh, I speak like Quebecois French a little bit. And so they're not they're not so they don't fancy that line, that accent so much uh but i found a really cool un, like a party under the bridge where there was people playing music and uh, it was it was cool that was like the authentic paris i, I think for people who don't know uh, paris syndrome is probably my favorite syndrome it's based on the japanese who have a direct flight to paris and they go with such amazing expectations about how wonderful paris is and then the uh the reality is slightly different and then they come back and need therapy to sort of get over it. <laughs> I think New York's probably the same too. <laughs> but yeah, they're sort of same. Like you're in America at the moment. I found in the Midwest, like the hospitality there was second to none. Um, mm. Whereas, as you say, sort of New York, California, <clears throat> people are more sort of set in their own life. Whereas the hospitality in middle America is, I would say, one of the best in the world. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And they get labeled with like, you know, guns and stuff, blah, blah, but they're, I was in Louisiana. That's the Midwest, right? I'm still confused by the Midwest being kind of East, honestly. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the friendliest people in, in the country, man. It's really nice there. Yeah. And so over the last um, year, you've sort of traveled all over the world, sort of. And what I love about your channel is that you sort of have take these adventures, which are very different to everyone's normal one week, two week vacation. It's sort of delving into sort of tribes in Africa and South America. And uh, probably one of the stories you would love to tell is the sort of story of one of those experiences. Yeah, so that's kind of what got me in the groove. Um, I made YouTube videos for a long time, but in the past couple of years, I found something that I really loved and that was visiting. Well, there's a the thing, man. I did biology in, in university. I wasn't a great student, but hey, uh, don't have to be. But I loved like the field courses. I always loved being outside and I had more books on bugs and, and things like that than anything else. Thank you. And so from there, I thought I wanted to travel the world to see animals and mountains and oceans. And I did, but I always found myself going back and thinking about my favorite memories. And it was the memories of people. It wasn't, you know, how cool that monkey was or what we saw on the scuba dive. I mean, I loved that, but it was always, I always felt more fondly towards the people that I met. And so I kind of followed that and started to focus my travels on meeting interesting people. And maybe some people listening now are the same way. You think back your travels and those are always the most powerful moments. I mean, we've just spent the past 10 minutes talking about the same thing, right? It's the people that we seem to travel for. <clears throat> and I went out to kind of find that to the extreme. So it took me all around the world to meet local tribes, interesting people. I was in Congo. I met like the sapeurs, the guys that were like the orange sparkly suits and walk the streets looking like millionaires in poverty. I uh, went to Tanzania to hunt baboons with the hunter-gatherers, the Hadza. Um, I was one of the first to do that on YouTube a couple of years ago, and it got like 11 million views. And those guys live traditionally how we used to live in the African Rift Valley. You know, they're still prying open <laughs> trees with their hands, pulling honey out, getting stung, shooting baboons with poison arrows and, and stuff like that. Um, but uh, there's a story that, that just happened in my life last, like November. Uh, it's now, what is it? June, a few months ago. And it's a, one, like a story I get a lot of questions about because people don't believe it's true. And I can guarantee people 
that it's true and I'm going to tell it today uh, if you don't mind. But there's no, it's it's a kind of an unorthodox encounter with humans <laughs> because it didn't really, it was kind of a, definitely a misadventure Def- and maybe one of the closest times I've ever felt like I was going to die, honestly. Oh, well, so what made you sort of go on this adventure? What was sort of drawing you towards it? Or was it completely accidental? No, it wasn't. It was, it was intentional for sure. The idea, the idea was solo camping. I love solo camping and coming from Canada, there's not, um, I've also have a fascination with castles. So I had this fantasy in my head, can, is it possible to solo camp in a castle? And here in North America, there's not very many castles and they're all natural heritage sites. But you go to Europe, there's a freaking million castles. There's so many castles, they, some of them don't have names. Like every hilltop has a castle almost in some places. And in Turkey especially, uh, in the, um, all through the central part, they're not necessarily castles, but they're um, like cliff homes and stuff. But there's, you think there's only a few, but there's, there's a million. And so in my head, I was like, it'd be cool to camp in some of these things. So my first castle was in Romania where I, I solo camped in there, this beautiful thing with a tower and I, on a hilltop and I had a campfire. And then the same thing happened in Cappadocia where there's all these cliff homes. And uh, I found like a cliff home away from the tourist track and, and, and camped inside of that. So these ancient tunnels carved by hand by, by people. And because there's so many, um, they're not Some are protected. Yeah, they're really nice ones. But there's lots that are like really, really quite nice that are just lost laying in the forest. There there might be a hiking trail to them, but there's no regulation. There's no ticket booth. There's no guard. There's there's nothing. And I'm always really respectful for these things. I'll clean up after I'm gone. I'm not trying to break anything. So I I found one in Turkey. I was traveling in northeastern Turkey near the border of Georgia and um, it were the more like Muslim side of following with this idea of solo camping in epic places. I was in Eastern Turkey, bordering Syria, Iran, Georgia, and there there's all kinds of ancient history. And I was kind of poking through different sites and blogs and posts trying to find cool locations to visit. And I found this place, John, called Satan's Castle. And Satan's Castle was this incredibly old place tower of stone that was placed in a valley. So if you picture like a valley and a, it like a, a cut with a knife through a cake. So there was this jagged rift and then there was a little outjut. And on this little outjut, this pillar of, of stone, there was this castle placed precariously on it. And there was a sort of small land bridge type thing connecting it to the ridge. And it was in the middle of nowhere. And it was, the, it was the perfect fantasy castle with a tower and this giant rampart and walls and bridges and it seemed just unbelievably interesting for being in a place so remote and I was going up to Georgia to meet my girlfriend at the time and we had parted ways and there's a lot of other cool things up there like there's a thing called mad honey this like hallucinogenic honey that is famous in Nepal it's also in Turkey so I was there and we tried some mad honey got a little crazy and I was on my way to meet her in uh, in Georgia Normally for these, these adventures, I'd have a local guide, we'd speak to the people because it always makes it more interesting. But there was some problems with logistics, getting a car rental, we were driving her four by four and it kept on breaking down. So we didn't have too much time. I was by myself and I was like, you know what, screw it. I'm passing by there anyway. It's only a couple hours off the highway. I'll hit that up and I'll meet her in Georgia. So I, in my rental car, I go get some wood. I get all the, the things you need to camp to make the kind of fantasy. And uh, I, all the documentation, there was no, again, didn't seem like there was any kind of guard or security. Didn't seem like a national heritage site. Just seemed like a bunch of really interesting rocks on top of another rock. And I was driving through one small village to get there. It was kind of maybe a, a mile or so away from the actual castle itself once we got there. So I was driving through this little town and it was filled with just cows and piles of cow shit and uh, blue tarped houses. It was like very, very rural. Again, a few houses there. I get there is a path that kind of walks along the ridge, valley to my right, mountains to my left. And there's a kind of like one parking spot and there's a sign that beat up sign that says Satan's Castle. And that was it. And so I wanted to go scout it. And so I do a quick run. And so maybe like a 15 minute walk along this, the side of this valley. 
And then you dip down and you come back up. And I saw the castle for the first time because it takes quite a while to get there hiking. And it was beyond anything I'd seen before. It looked like it was from a Hollywood movie. The tower went up into the sky. There was vultures circling around. It was, it was perfect. And so I go back and I get my backpack and I get all of my bits and pieces to camp. Um, still not knowing if I was going to camp, but if the opportunity was there, let's freaking do it. And so I'm going and along the way, there's one shirtless Turkish man with like a big burly chest riding a bareback horse, holding on to the mane. And he like waves at me as he's bringing his sheep and cows past. <laughs> Uh, and it's the only guy I saw. So we have a little wave. He's like kind of weirded out that I'm there uh, with, you know, a backpack full of stuff. And I make the hike and I'm sweating and I crawl down the side of the valley and I crawl back up and there I am solo in Satan's castle. And it was probably around 1 PM. <clears throat> and so I'm exploring, I'm, you know, being a YouTuber to the max running around. There's like murder holes, you know, those holes in the ramparts, you can drop oil down. They have those, they've got these, all these different towers with arrow slits in them and everything. I'm like in a, a kid in the candy shop. It, it felt like I had, I was in ancient times, basically. There was an old chapel with carved stone kind of offset to the side. I was exploring in there. There was these tunnels that kind of led around different places too. So many secrets. I was hoping I could get in the tower, but it looks at some point that the stairs had broken, but it was still, it was still totally fine. Um, there was a couple peculiar, peculiar, peculiar things though. There was a couple peculiar things though, and some of them were ominous for, uh, later, later problems, later misadventures. So a couple things, there was almost like holes that looked like they were blown open in the side of it a couple places. And I thought maybe it was an old tunnel or, or what something people exploring and damaging. I didn't quite understand, but there was a, a series of these floodlights that were placed around the castle too, to, to light it up at night. And I was like, Oh, that's kind of weird because again, we're so far away from anybody being able to see it you know there's no there's no tourists here that i saw but even then there's no village there's no way to see it if it was lit up so why would it be but it didn't matter because these lights all had their wires cut so there was like a floodlight that was smashed and the wire was cut so i was like okay well i guess it's not going to be a problem for later because it would kind of bust the bubble if there was big floodlights on this thing and i'm having the time of my life so sun starts to set quite early because we're in a valley and it was about four or 5 PM and I'm starting to make a campfire, set up my camp. Uh, I found a nice spot and things were looking good. And so I made a little bit of food and was filming like a star lapse. And I, uh, at one point I, <laughs> I think I had lost my head torch because I was so excited running around and, and camera gear with camera gear. But one thing I always do in these places is I, again, always thinking about the shot, I bring the materials to fashion like a traditional torch, like a fire torch, like a wooden dowel with some fuel and some wire and some cloth. And so I had lost my head torch, I think at the base of the castle as I was climbing up and filming. And I was like, I'll just make my, you know, my, my medieval torch and explore and, and take some photos of it. Wouldn't it be epic of this guy exploring an old castle with a torch? And so I make that and then I, I light it and I'm walking down. It's the dark. It's probably around 11 p.m. around 12. And I set up the, tri the tripod and I get a shot of me walking out. And, and then um, I'm descending down and then I hear a sound. And so to explain this correctly, I'm on this kind of outjut of the valley and I can see the trail from across the um the, the gap between the ridge and where I am. So there's kind of like a the trail you can see it kind of walking, uh, spin, sp spinning around the side of the mountain wall. And then you have to come up. And so anybody to come towards me has to walk along this trail and then dip down and come back up. But between us, there is a, a crevasse, right? So I'm there and there was one, one singular street light that was lit on that trail, but all the lights on the castle were off, which I was kind of happy about, honestly. Would have ruined the vibe. But I look and there's people standing there in that street light. It's maybe like a couple hundred meters away, but I can see them. Definitely. There's three people standing there. I was like, that's kind of weird, but you know, that's fine. And then I hear a gunshot and the, 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 the ripping of the, of the bullet zoom over my head through the air. I'm making my own sound effects now. And <laughs> And I was like, okay, 
Um, that's weird. But a couple weeks ago, we were camping in this four by four and there was people who woke us up with their guns at dawn because they were shooting ducks uh, just by our, our four by four. And so I was like, oh, maybe these are hunters. But again, it's kind of a weird time to hunt. And then I hear screaming like I just screwed somebody's mother, like screaming like I had just killed a baby. It was the most horrific screaming. And I, I didn't speak Turkish. And so they were yelling and yelling and screaming. And I was like, oh, who are they talking to? And then another bullet zips by my head. I'm like, no, that they're, they're talking to me. They're screaming at me. They're shooting at me. <clears throat> and in my head, I'm like, this has got to be a misunderstanding. What, why? How? Like, maybe they think I'm just some damn kid here, like spray painting and having sex with my girlfriend or something. I don't know. Like, why? Why are they shooting and screaming? They must be just trying to scare me away. And so I extinguish the torch and I'm hiding behind this rock <clears throat> thinking that they'll think I left. No, they come sprinting. So these three guys shoot another shot, scream and come sprinting along the path to where I am. So what do you do? In my head, I've been to a lot of places, seen a lot of people. I have the belief that people are kind and these things don't happen in real life. Here we are and it's happening in real life. Is it a misunderstanding? They're shooting guns at me. I mean, <laughs> best case scenario, they're just, I don't know, playing a joke. Doesn't sound like a joke. Worst case scenario, they are terrorists or they are crazy drunk locals who think I shouldn't be there or something. You know what I mean? So I have to make a decision. There's only one way on and off where I am. It's that little basic land bridge. They have maybe about 15 minutes of running, jogging before they can make it to get me. I know I, have, I can get there in about five. So my choice is to sit and hide on this. Again, it's an island, basically. There's nowhere to hide. I can hide in the castle, but there's three guys. It's not, <laughs> it's not, it doesn't really work that way. Um, or try to beat them out the front door, the front gate, and climb into the mountains before they get there. So I go for that option. And I don't want to light my light. So I have my phone and I was like, I don't want to use the flashlight on my phone. So actually what I did is I pressed record on the phone. So then I could use this, the, the, the vague light of the screen. Um, and also, hey, if uh, everything worked out, I'd have at least audio of what's going on. So I, so I could use that very dim light just to see my, where my feet were because it's all just mixed boulders and sticks and stones and stuff. So I scramble up, my feet going down between the, the holes in the rocks. I grab like just my backpack as my passport. I didn't really care about my camera. I was like passport and basics, right? So I, I grab that kind of stuff and I sprint out and I make it out the front door before they make it into the front door. And I'm hiding on the side of this cliff, like holding on to shrubs growing, up this, growing off the side of a cliff as they walk by maybe mm, 20 feet. 15 meters beside me with their flashlights and guns. I see them as I'm peering through the bushes. These guys searching for me with flashlights and guns. They go up into the castle and I hear them screaming and shooting again. And they walk up to the top of the, like the rampart and they're looking and the feeling of having some people, you know, that are armed who in this case, I didn't know they were trying to hurt me, but obviously they weren't trying to be friends searching with a flashlight and you're in the bush as the flashlight crosses across your vision and you see them stop for a second. That's a feeling I will never forget. You're being hunted basically. And again, I, I just think back to, to other people in the past that other significant events that we, when you actually were hunted and you knew if you were caught, you were dead. That wasn't necessarily the case for me, but it was in the realm of possibility at that point. That's a horrible feeling. I'll never forget that. So whenever the flashlight wasn't in my direction, I would try to scramble up the side of this cliff to get higher up into the, into the mountains. I had my cell phone and I had one sliver of 3G. I had a friend of mine, a Turkish friend, who lived a couple hours away. And he's the only person I, I, know, I knew there. So I texted him and I was like, his name was Suat. And I said, Suat, I'm here at the castle. He knew I was going. I told him I was going. And there's people here and they have guns. And he's like, what do they want? I'm like, I don't want to know what they want, but they don't want me here. 
And he's like, okay, where's your stuff? And I said, I left it. Like, well, they're going to steal it. They're obviously terrorists or they're they're there to cause problems. So what do you have? I'm like, I have like a basic backpack and my passport. And he's like, okay, well, um, I'll call the police. You sit tight. And so time goes by. It feels like hours. It was about 35 minutes of me waiting and them again, shooting more shots, screaming, looking for a flashlight. Now they're starting to realize, hmm, he's not in the castle anymore. And they're start, starting to wander back along the path where I am, like towards where I am coming back around the castle. And I was like, oh, fuck. Like at that point, I couldn't really, I could climb farther, but it's very, like it was very dangerous. And it was very cold too. It was like November and I wasn't appropriately dressed. So in my head, I'm like, I go back down to say, hey guys, I'm sorry. Or I keep climbing and I risk exposure um, I risk falling. It was just not a good situation. Um, but the way they were screaming, I just chose to go higher into the mountains. I didn't even have my car keys, so I couldn't sneak back out to the car. And there's only one path. They would have seen me go back on the path, so I would have had to stay the night in the mountains. But I knew I didn't want to go back there. So I go, and um, I'm crouched. I'm trying to get farther away, and the flashlight keeps sweeping by, and I sprint when it's not coming my direction. And then I get a call back from, um, from Suat. And I'm like, hey, so what, man, they're still here. Where are the police? And he goes, okay, the police are there. And I was like, fuck, finally, man. And he's like, yeah, all right, just hold tight. And then um, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. And then I, he calls me back and goes, okay, the police have been there for, for like an hour and a half. And I was like, I called you like an hour, 15 minutes ago. And he was like, yeah, but they're there. Can you see them? And I was like, no, I don't see them. And I was like, I would have seen anybody else come because there's only one path. And then he's like, okay, let me call back. And then, so he calls me back and he goes, dude, those are the police. They're coming to look for you. They think you're a terrorist and a treasure hunter and you're trying to steal the treasure from Satan's castle. And I was like, oh shit. So what had happened is that I walked in with my big backpack full of, you know, tripods and gear and stuff. I mean, tourists would come there, but they'd come with a little sacky of water and snacks or something, right? So this guy parks his car, his rental car, brings all this stuff in, gear and shit, that one guy would have saw me, or maybe some people in the village would have saw me and saw me stay. And apparently there's this treasure, this treasure of a princess that's hidden underneath Satan's castle that no one's ever found. So there was a history there. And what had happened, man, is that the police showed up and they saw that all the lights were cut. Someone had cut all of the lights and the lights were there to keep treasure hunters away from the castle. And so when they showed up and they saw that the lights were cut and there was a report of a treasure hunter and terrorist stealing the treasure from the locals, they're like, we got to get this guy. And that's why they stormed the castle to get me because they thought I was after the princess's treasure. So I'm there on the cliff and I'm putting all this together and I was like, of course, of course it's this, right? Of course, like people just don't hunt other people in real life. But I was like, Suat, are you 100% sure? Because these guys seem really angry. And he's like, no, definitely. Like I spoke to one of them on the phone. They're waiting for you by your tent. And so I, I do like this walk of shame back. End up finding my head torch on the path, which I didn't have time to find before. Go up and I'm still like shaking because I'm like, these guys just were literally hunting me with guns. And they shot eight shots. I meet them. And they're like, oh, Mike, we're so sorry, man. We're so sorry. And they spoke, they spoke broken English. And they're like, why, why, why did you run? Why did you run? I'm like, because you were fucking shooting me, man. What am I supposed to do? And they've got the Kalashnikov and a pistol. And I'm like, did you, did you, you were shooting at me. And he goes, oh, yeah, look, look with this. And he hands me the pistol to hold. And he's like, why are you here? Why are you spending the night? And uh, I was like, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm the photographer. I make YouTube videos. And he's like, oh, you're on YouTube. What's your channel? We'll subscribe. So these guys subscribed to my YouTube channel. And then they're like, you can't stay here. Listen, like it's dangerous. There's bears and there's wolves. I mean, I'm used to bears and wolves with Canadian camping. But they're like, you can't stay here. We'll put you up in a, in a hotel down the road. You know, we'll drive you there. Just don't worry. We're like, we're so sorry. It's a misunderstanding. And, and yeah. So they, they're like, they were happy that I wasn't a treasure hunter and I'm happy that I wasn't being hunted. But if you want to, here's a, if anybody's listening, if you want to catch a treasure hunter, 
don't shoot eight shots and scream like you just effed their mother. Sneak up on them. If they would have snuck up on me with, with guns, like they would have saw I was doing nothing, number one, and we would have avoided this altercation. Shooting and screaming and storming the castle did not make me, it doesn't make it easier to get caught. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, no harm, no foul. Hell of a good story. I did, because I was using the, the, the camera, the, the phone as a bit of a flashlight, I do have <laughs> some of it on camera and was able to, and I was filming all that day for a video, right? So I have, I had it, oh, I have it all on camera. There's a YouTube video out there if you want to watch it, but it was, it was the, the most scared I'd been traveling, which is kind of funny because my online alias is fearless and far. <laughs> yeah, there was a sort of part where, as you say, you're sort of hiding from them. And th there's always that moment of like when they're close and you you either want to be the first one out the block to say, hey, hey, look, it's obviously a misunderstanding. Where that sort of, uh, you know, weighing up the possibilities of run or own up, where was that sort of in your mindset? Because you decided to run. Was there a part of you that was like, this has to be, or was it just the fear and the adrenaline pumping through you that like, I'm in a country, I don't know that well, this could be dangerous. I guess I kind of go into game mode with that stuff uh, because I, I put myself, I mean, this is on a situation I find myself often, but like through free diving and skydiving and scuba diving and a lot of these adventures, I know I'm often in places where there is danger there, but I, I've trained myself enough to handle it. So when that feeling kicks in, I've put a lot of time to understand fear and how it works in my body and other people's bodies. And that's why I love talking about that. And that's why the channel is called Fearless and Far, not because I am fearless, but because I've realized fearlessness is a choice in most circumstances. It's not a, a, a form of enlightenment where you one day you become fearless. If you continue to grow as a person, you'll always have fear. So that's the message. So when this happened and me knowing that this stuff doesn't happen in real life, so rarely, like lottery odds, I was like 80% chance this is, a, this is a total misunderstanding. But they sound very angry and they are shooting shots and 20% chance I just am super unlucky. And those odds, I didn't like those odds. If it was 99% fine, I probably would have owned up. But the way they were screaming and shooting and then they sprinted towards me made me think that, you know, maybe this one time I'm wrong and maybe this is the, you know, the, the thing everyone's worried about happening in front of me. And I didn't put together like, okay, if I did run in, into the, into the, the forest, into the, the mountain, what did, what would that mean? In my head, it was just that I'm getting away from them. But again, like I could fall off the cliff. That's instant death. That could have even happened. You know, I, if I, if I didn't have any reception, I would have spent the night in the cold on the side of a mountain that's death from exposure, hypothermia. So those were real things I didn't consider in the moment that were like the, you know, then what happens then big, big guy, you know, when you're actually hiding out <laughs> uh, and they don't leave. I, I guess I assume they'd come, they'd check and then they'd leave when they didn't find me, but they didn't leave. They were, they, they were very adamant to find me. So if I didn't have that one bar of reception, I would have probably said hiding in the mountains. I don't know, but it was just not not a good situation. And with all the adrenaline pumping back to the mm -hmm. hotel, I imagine the night's sleep that night would have been heart racing, trying to sort of calm yourself <laughs> down. <laughs> well, we they drove me back to this like boutique hotel on this like lakeside resort. Uh, it was a couple about an hour drive away, and we sat there and we smoked cigarettes and drove and drank. Uh, yeah, yaki, no, raki together, this moonshine type drink. So we, with these guys who just <laughs> we had this experience with, went back, smoked cigarettes, drank, drank raki for like two hours or something like that. And uh, then actually I told when I, when I was in the middle of all this and I didn't know the outcome, the first person I messaged before Suat was my girlfriend saying, this guy's here with guns, here's my location. And so I pinned the location. And she's like, I'm coming. I'm like, don't, don't freaking come. Like, I don't even know what's happening. Just you stay where you are. Cause she was about two hours driving, doing her own solo camping in her four by four. I was like, don't come. I don't want, I don't need you here right now. You know, like, there's nothing. She's like, I'll come. I'll just come, I'll come talk to them. I'm like, I, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> so anyway, she didn't listen to me and she, she drove anyway. So she arrived uh, about an, uh, an hour after we arrived at the hotel. And so I was able to talk to her <laughs> through everything <laughs> after having some alcohol and cigarettes with the boys. So all in all, it turned out to be a great night. <laughs>
Um, but yeah, it was it was a few moments of just pure harrowing adventure. I think there when you sort of talk about sort of solo camping, sorry, solo camping, and the way it sort of breaks down that sort of fear of the first time you do it, it's slightly terrifying for people on the, who are listening to the podcast who haven't done it. It's that sort of fear that something like this might happen, but it's incredibly rare. Mm. This so rare, so rare. <clears throat> and yeah, as I say, you know, we spoke with Ava last year, Ava Zubek on what? Okay, well, that's yeah, the girl. Yeah, yeah. That was, that's my girlfriend. <laughs> so she's the one who came. Yeah, she's the one who came and and uh, <laughs> and we were doing solo separate yeah, solo. Yeah, so she was sort night. of saying, mm-hmm. like, you know, so many times you have the most incredible experience doing the solo camping and people sort of think that stuff like this happens all the time, but it is just incredibly rare, but a great story to tell as well. <laughs> exactly. And so you hear the great stories, right? And I, I had done, I've done so much solo camping and all with just such an amazing feeling after. And you're right, exactly. Because the first time you go, even if it's in your backyard, you're like, you hear a snap of a twig and you're like, oh my God, it's a bear. <laughs> But after a while, you start to put some logic into it. Like if it was a bear, would the bear just magically appear next to your tent and the sticks would crack? No, you'd hear it coming. Like when you actually hear a bear coming, one time when I did go solo camping, a bear came uh, and I could hear it coming for 15 minutes. And so finally, when it did emerge from the forest, I was like, ah, and it was like, oh, and it sprinted away. And that was like my greatest fear, you know, encountering a bear while while solo camping in Canada. Uh, But it was it was more spooked than I was. People shoot them with guns. They generally don't want anything to do with people. If you have food around, it's different. Just make sure your food's not there. But uh, generally, yeah. But as you say, it's sort of conquering that fear that you once had before you encountered that bear. There was probably, as you say, that running through your head. And then once you've sort of had that experience, you know how to uh, counteract it when it does happen. Yeah, maybe military police with assault rifles too. Yeah, maybe exactly. That's how that works. Because <laughs> it was the military exactly. police that Le- came after me. So next time when they come shooting and screaming, I'll be like, all right, hey guys, I got some Rocky here and cigarettes I've already. Got a nice it's a for you guys, come on up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, it's an absolutely incredible story. And, you know, you've got probably a million more stories to tell. But there's a part of the show where we ask the same five questions to each guest each week. With uh, the first question being, what does it mean to have purpose? I think it's the key to happiness. <clears throat> it's hard to find it, but without purpose, I think you feel lost and demotivated and people wonder why they succumb to addictions, whether it be alcohol or video games or social media flipping through, um, looking for likes and comments, whatever. Those are all addictions. Without strong purpose, you you default to those things because you need something to to keep going. I'm not a religious guy, but I think that we've since we've removed religion in a lot of people's lives, they've found other ways to find purpose. I think the human soul needs something to give them that. And around the world, you see people find their their purpose through religion, through a belief system. Well, the problem is now science is gotten in there and kind of meddled with a few of the, 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 the points. And so we don't, a lot of us don't believe in a higher purpose and, but what purpose do we have? None. Some find it in me, travel, adventure, sharing my thoughts on fear in the world. I gather bits and pieces like some mosaic that I find I've used on death from Mexico and Toraya and in Indonesia. And I've been able to build my own. Um, I guess it's more belief system than purpose, but through all that, you find your place. But it's hard because it takes time. Um, I think it's 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 the most important thing to focus on. But it's not something you're going to get by watching a how to find your purpose video on YouTube. It's something you get by spending the time reading books. And here's the thing I like about books is that if you can watch a motivational video on YouTube and you feel good for a bit. But a book takes time. It's basically like a, a series where every day or every couple of days you open, you read pages, and it just affirms this belief, this this thing you're learning, this topic. And that's what you need. You need to have it sink in. You have to stew in it. And if you don't have purpose out there, um, I would say journal. Like for me, I I found it through journaling and reading books and traveling the world and seeing how other people lived. I journal every single day. I have a book. The front half is more kind of like getting shit done. 
Um, creatively, the back half is I just do, I do morning pages. I dump the thoughts in my head. I think about all of these different bits and pieces of my life, why I am the way I am. That's actually how I discovered one day about this rock thing and how it led to where I am now um, and how it's kind of the same thing, flipping over these rocks and looking in unexpected places for beauty. It's exactly the same thing. I found that just by putting on music, either in the morning, drinking some coffee, or at night, cigar, rum and coke, and just kind of shooting the shit. Am I happy? Yes or no? Rating out of 10. How do I feel my, with my friendships, my purpose? Just really thinking about that because it takes time. And we're these complicated creatures that, you know, you get bruised as a kid. Like for me, <clears throat> uh, there as long as you like. <laughs> For me, like uh, going deeper into this fear thing, uh, in grade four, I got brought up in front of a classroom and made fun of twice uh, uh, by the teacher. And that stuck. And so for most of my life, I, I, I had a, a fear of public speaking. And now, obviously, I don't have a problem at all. And that's been my journey, like overcoming that thing and, and actually flourishing in it and becoming better than most at it because I've worked hard at it. But that journey in itself, I had to Put a lot of the pieces together because no one gets through childhood unbruised like we're these impressionable balls of clay and so you have these childhood traumas that you've mostly forgot about or you don't know how they've affected your adult life like these little fears as kids they manifest themselves as these adult fears so you're not you know scared of the monster under the bed but you're scared of like failure or being alone or like they manifest themselves they're very smart they, there's adult versions of these things that are basically the same thing and you have, to, you have to figure that shit out first. And then once you get all the bullshit out of the way, then purpose and deeper things, happiness and all this, and they can they can show themselves more clearly. But there's there's shit you got to wade through first. So um, there's your your long answer to a short rapid fire question. Ah, <laughs> oh, that was absolutely <clears throat> brilliant. <clears throat> and what about your favorite quote? I probably have two. <clears throat> <clears throat> and I might... Uh, Chain, I might have forgotten the words exactly, but Anais Yin had one that said, um, and then, it, and then, hold on. <clears throat> Anais said, uh, Anais Yin, Anais Yin said that, and then the time came when the risk it took to stay in a bud overcame the risk it took to blossom. Almost like that. So basically, I feel like that's how a lot of people live their life, where they live all tight in the bud, and then all of a sudden the pressure builds, the risk it takes to stay the same overcomes the risk and fear it takes to change, and then your life change, changes forever. And it was put very, very eloquently by her. Also, Joseph Campbell uh, has a good one that um, I live my life by too, and it's, it's um, the cave you fear to enter hides the treasure that you seek. And that's been a guiding light in my life because <clears throat> quite often fear is a compass where, where, you, where you feel resistance and discomfort. If you go that direction, in my case, it was the public speaking. Dude, like I, I was a shy kid with a phobia of public speaking and now I have a, a travel TV show, a, 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 a YouTube channel with a, a million subscribers, a podcast. How? It's because I entered that goddamn cave. The one I, with my hands shaking and my heart beating. People don't do that. I, I was beaten around enough by life <laughs> to do some crazy things. It's a long story, but crazy thing is, means like going on my first solo trip. I was so scared to do that. But you go and everything's fine. And all of a sudden, if you follow that fear compass and you, you use it as a guiding light going into those dark caves, your life changes forever. That's where your dream life is. That's where you find your purpose and your happiness is by doing those things. And that's why I speak so much about it. Yeah, I think uh, we've had people on who sort of talk about like breaking out of that sort of fear and almost like a balloon, you blow it up and it gets a bit bigger and you think, oh, wow, I'm, I can get to this. And then you blow up a bit more and it's a bit bigger. Yeah. And gradually and gradually it just gets <clears throat> bigger. And the same with like your first quote, I think it's very similar to the one of like, a sailing boat was made to go to the sea and not to stay in a harbor, even <laughs> yeah. though I, a I have, a boat in, it's a boat in harbor is safe, but that's not what boats are. Something like that. One of those cliche yeah. travel quotes you see like in cursive on a white wall like this. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've absolutely butchered it. So everyone can enjoy that one. <laughs>
A, sh- a ship and harbor is safe, but that's not what ships are meant for. There we go. <laughs> is it, John? <clears throat> Spoken perfectly. And what about your favorite travel book and why? Favorite travel book. The first travel book I read um, was Vagabonding by Rolf Potts. Got to meet Rolf Potts. He's a super awesome guy. Just met him a couple a uh, couple weeks ago. Um, but that book now is because that was like the first manual how to do this, right? And then there was like four hour work week, which kind of built on that and and forward. Um, my favorite travel book, there is actually hold on. I just read one. There we go. This is not this is not it, but it's by the same author. Uh, there's a guy named Jedediah Jenkins who wrote a book called To Shake the Sleeping Self. And I want to bring this up specifically because it's not necessarily my favorite travel book, but I read it and I realized that this is because it was called To Shake the Sleeping Self by Jedediah Jenkins. It was the perfect book that I needed to read when I was going to first start my adventure. So I don't know where everyone is, listeners at home, on your personal adventures. But if you're looking for a book to inspire you to get out there, that's a great book. He's a great writer and he chronicles how he started his bike journey from um, the United States, I believe, down to Argentina. Um, haven't finished the book yet. I didn't finish the book because it wasn't the one I needed at the time, but uh, it was a fantastic way to get the inspiration to start a trip. And I think for most people, it's it's starting the trip is the hardest part. And for me, like I was a kid from a small town, I'm not going to find some guy at the local bar who it's going to be like, oh, yeah, man, f- take your bike down to, to Argentina. Go to Congo. Go go backpacking in Congo. It's fine. It's fine. Don't worry about it. That doesn't happen. So you need you need those, like I said, mentioned books and things to, to, to have that voice in your head. Podcasts work too, but being able to hang out with hang out with someone either in a literary form or in an audio form to, 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 I mean, this podcast is the same thing. You get to meet us or hear our stories and, and hang and, and get more data points on how you can actually do these things. Um, really powerful stuff. So that's what I'd recommend, definitely, uh, if you're looking to get out there, which I think most of us are. Yeah, absolutely. And why are these adventures important to you? <clears throat> I think it's the essence of the human soul. I don't know. Um, maybe I'm just that way. I-, I was always the guy who wanted to know what was over the next hill or you know, under the next rock. And inside of us all, I feel, is the is the nomad spirit, the explorer spirit. We are roaming hunter gatherers uh, originally and they're like why have we always tried to see what's on the other side of the ocean or the other side of the mountain maybe it's because something deep down inside of us thinks it's you know greener pastures or more bountiful forests with animals to eat i don't know what it is but i've got a mad affliction of, of whatever that is and the world while the world is mostly explored um on a map, let's say, uh, there's still all kinds of incredible discoveries all of the time, people and foods and places and animals and, and ways of living and I, I, it'll never end. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I'm just really drawn to that, knowing that each experience that I have, uh, using that mosaic example again, th- I collect those. It's like pieces for a lens in my life. I, I don't think I was born into a culture that gave me the correct lens. I never really felt like I totally fit in or agreed with everything that I saw. So I smashed that and I've been collecting bits and fragments from around the world to create my own in which I can see the world and myself in it more clearly. And I don't think that'll ever be completely, there'll always be a couple little missing pieces or a better piece I can swap in. And uh, I like stories and I like meeting interesting people. And that all ties together with this uh, modern day adventure kind of attitude we have, I think. And seeing what, the, seeing what we're possible of. I think like we, we, don't, we don't use this machine that we have, this, this biological machine. We don't go out there and test it. It's incredible the things our bodies can do. And we don't ever put them to the test. I like seeing other people do these things, meeting other people who are, you know, climbing, tr- you know, 40 meter trees to get bees nests out of canopies. Like humans can do this stuff. People can hold their breath for 10 minutes to catch fish on the bottom of the ocean with a, with a stick. Like it's incredible what humans can do. Uh, and I love seeing it. So yeah, all that and curiosity, you know? Yeah. It's that sort of curiosity to see how far you can go really. Exactly. 
<clears throat> and in your lifetime, what's where's the most memorable place you've been and why? <clears throat> we last year spent about a month in Tanzania. And there's a tribe there called the Hadza that I had brought up, I think, briefly earlier. And the Hadza are some of the last true hunter-gatherers on the planet. And we think like there's lots of remote places still where people live traditionally. It's getting less and less, man. Um, most people now have cell phones and blue jeans. You can go to like maybe Papua New Guinea or maybe deep parts of the Amazon or like North Sentinel Island <laughs> or something, if you dare, and, uh, and find like true, you know, true experiences, authentic experience. Well, let's say traditional experiences. They're all, they're all, all, are all authentic, I guess. Um, but these guys, they reject modern technology for the most part. They don't want to eat mzungo food, like normal people food. They don't want to you know, use technology. They just want to hunt in the mornings, eat meat and eat honey. That's what they want to do. So we got to hang out with these guys and <clears throat> it, it's so, so it was so powerful to me to meet someone from a life so different than mine. They wake up every morning, laying, sleeping on, on and under the stars on the, the on the dirt. They go hunt with their poison arrows, and they crack open beehives with the bare hands. And they get stung, and they giggle, and they tell fart jokes, and they they chase each other and they play and they smoke pot. They, <laughs> they take like loose leaf or I've heard people talk about them. A missionary tried to come give them a, um, a Bible and they use the Bible pages as, <laughs> as, uh, papers for joints. I tried to confirm that cause they were using like newspaper and loose leaf. And then, yeah, there was a missionary that came here and they're like, Oh, you should believe in our, in our God, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And they're like, okay, uh, yeah, sure. But where is he? Oh, he's up in the sky. Oh, well, when he comes, we'll 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 think about it. But it, um, tell him to come. And so the, the missionaries weren't very successful with with this crew of guys. <laughs> but you go, and I guess you, what I'm getting at here is like, we're, we were raiding this baboon camp at night, and we're like walking around in our bare feet trying to get a baboon with a bow and arrow in the dark, and you just realize we're all the freaking same, man. Um, we're we're all yeah. So we have different pastimes and activities, I guess, but we all like have the same foundation. We all want to be appreciated. We need food and water and we just want to love and procreate and have a family and all this kind of stuff. And we think we're so different with our languages and religions and, you know, it's, we're not, we're all, we're all the same. And, uh, anything that's, that's gross or strange that we think it's a problem with ourselves. If you call something gross or weird, because it's, it's your problem with an understanding. And, uh, you know, things in your life, p peanut butter can be weird uh, to, to someone else on the other side of the country, right? So, I don't know. I guess I just fall in love with the world and how that we're, we all think we're so different, but we're all exactly the same everywhere we go. And I think the question was one of my greatest adventures. I kind of got off track again, or most memorable. It was, yeah, hanging out with these guys, hunting baboons, <laughs> realizing that we're all this one f giant family of people and we try to put all these barriers between us, uh, language, religion, bullshit like that. But we're not. We're the same man. And the world is kind, even if some people have assault rifles and charge you in the night. They were kind guys and they apologized and they subscribed. <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, that's three more subscribers. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And one of them, one of the guys still watches all my stuff and he popped into the chat because people were like, oh, it's so fake. You can see his uh, head torch at this, this minute, this second, uh, because I had found it, but I didn't acknowledge that, I guess. But then one of the police popped in the chat and it's like, oh no, like, we're so sorry. He's a good guy. It was miscommunication. And anyway, it's really funny stuff, man. Oh, that's absolutely amazing. And yeah, as I say, the more you travel, the more you sort of get an understanding of this, the more you suddenly realize that everyone's the same. And everyone who travels says that. And um, I think it's a message that people need to understand. But you have to go there and see it. Yeah, you have to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. can't, let, can't let the media just dictate what you believe and what you don't. Yeah, well, they, in my opinion, they... It's a, they love fear because fear keeps you watching and watching makes the money. So if you're not afraid, you're not watching. So don't go out fear. there and live your life. Don't, don't see for yourself. Trust us. We've never yeah. been there, but we know. It's, it's good clickbait. 
clickbait is how the world works, my man. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what is next and how can people follow you in your future adventures? Right now I'm in LA, <clears throat> which is a bit uncharacteristic of me, but I was at the Emmys last weekend, the daytime Emmys, because the television show I was hosting, Uncharted Adventure, which is on the Weather Channel in the United States, one hour adventure show, what got nominated for an Emmy. So we did the fancy red carpet thing, wore like a black suit, more comfortable eating bugs in the jungle than on a red carpet, but hey, do the things that make you uncomfortable. So uh, we didn't get the Emmy, but just getting nominated in our first season for, it was, the category was travel, adventure, and uh, and nature. So it was such an honor to be there and be recognized in the first season. So we're starting filming our second season in a couple of weeks. We're doing uh, 11 countries in, in 14 episodes. That'll be the rest of my year. But hey, I, I have YouTube's a place that I started. And so I've got four or five new YouTube videos coming up um, there. I just got back from Ethiopia where I did things like scarification with the Mercy tribe. The Mercy are supposed to be the most dangerous tribe in the world. They run around with like Kalashnikovs and there's some stories. But again, going back to what we said, you meet the guys, they're freaking rad. Um, but they do drink cow blood and do scarification which I also did both of those things. So I got some scars in my arm. Actually, I don't know if you can see them, but mm, they're right there. Not Lighting's not very Ooh. good. But there was That's... a lot of blood. I also drank some blood because it's what they do. And um, so YouTube's, YouTube's a fun place to be. <laughs> and you that kind of get, stuff. Have you managed to get the ash and the uh, cow dung off? Yeah, exactly. Covered in ash and cow dung. I, I, I only brought one shirt for a week and my cameraman and my fixer were talking about how bad I smelled. But hey, yo, it's an adventure. Do you have to have a fresh t-shirt every single day? I don't think so. Oh, it's good sun cream as well, wasn't it? it that's exactly <laughs> it. That's what I thought. Uh, and so I have a podcast as well called um, Against the Odds, where we tell uh, true travel stories. And that's done with the Wandry Network. So podcast Against the Odds, YouTube, Instagram, uh, Fearless and Far, and the TV show is called Uncharted Adventure. Amazing. Well, for everyone listening, go check it out. It's uh, it's very, very interesting to watch. And some of the places you go are extraordinary. And it's Thank an amazing you. sort of, you know, adventures that you go on. Very different from the rest of the YouTubers out there. You might play it safe in Bali. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, there won't be any Bali or, or best beaches in Mexico. But honestly, just to finish it off, my goal is to show the world how interesting it can be. And also that, hey, these people that we think are so different are not. And so I will always go do what the locals do, even if people call me crazy. They often do. Good. I just think it's a different way of living and there's no right and there's no wrong way. And I'll always show you the local way, even if it means horrible diarrhea or a little bit of blood. It's, uh, I'm, in for the, I'm in for the whole, the whole experience, man, to the max. Well, amazing, Mike. Thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you, John. My pleasure.